Thank you for joining us for the Salty Witches podcast and all you saltines out there. Whether you're joining us on YouTube or listening to the podcast on one of the myriad of streaming platforms that we are available on, we thank you and we appreciate you. Again, hit that like, share, and subscribe button if you are joining us on YouTube and or other places where you have the ability to do that. We're just going to jump right in tonight. Uh, so we're going to start with some listener questions. The first listener question comes from the Pocket Watch Fox. Hi there. Love the podcast. I'm a new fan and have been listening nonstop all week. But I have this feeling like I can trust you guys. That's their last mistake. So I would like to share something that I have shared with very few people. So I'm trying to think of the best way to begin because this is going to sound like a lot. It is a lot. It's a novel. We appreciate it. Whew. First off, have you heard of a channeler uh, who is not aware that they are a channeler or unwilling to be a channel? Basically, somebody who falls asleep and gets channeled and seems to have uh, no say in the matter. This oh, is, this happens to you a lot. Does it? Yeah. Oh. You fall asleep. And you're like, yeah, baby, channel me so hard. And I'm just like laying there next to you. And I'm like, what is he channeling about? <laughs> anyway, this is a long oh, dreaming. story. Sorry, dreaming. <laughs> this is a long story, but I'll skip ahead to the part where I'm laying in bed around 3 a.m. And the person next to me starts to talk in their sleep. After a while, I realize I cannot wake them up no matter what. And they are trying to tell me something. I start recording on my phone because I'm fascinated by the situation. It becomes apparent that I'm speaking to a spirit that is using the person next to me to speak to me. They give me warnings about how a demon was sent by somebody to cause upheaval in our lives with the direct intention of self-harm. The spirit also gives me coded information. I have to ask her for everything. She, I'm saying she because at some point I have narrowed down who I think this person was when they were alive, tells me about stuff when she used to be alive and seems insulted when I ask if she's dead. The whole hour is like 20 questions and the answers are vague and it's as if the questions I asking don't apply where she is communi communicating from. The firm info she gives me and this is the exact date and time the demon was sent and when I press for more information, the person she's using next to me starts to choke, so I stop. She gives me some coded information, stuff I can't make heads or tails of, that seems to refer to something in the afterlife and when I ask how and when I use the information, she says, you will fill it. I panic about how to protect us and she says she will. Then she says she's losing the connection and asks me to count down from 10. She apologizes to me twice as I'm counting down and then after I say one, the person channeling her gasps like somebody being reanimated in a hospital and starts violently weeping. This person has, to this day, trouble believing they were channeling and is afraid of the topic. This story is a short version. The conversation with the spirit talks about a lot of stuff and was very, very long. I have spent the good part of the last seven years researching what the code-like information might mean that I was told. In 2018, I sat down and put the entire conversation to text. I was also visited the place where the body of the person I believe to have been speaking to had been found. There was a darkness about that incident, and the police had investigated for days, labeling the death as quote-unquote suspicious, but could not figure out what happened. As I spoke to the neighbor, a bell from the door, that's her, I blurted out. The neighbor didn't agree or disagree, but the person, who is also the channeler in question, looked at me and said, it means we need to leave now. That's what she's saying. And we left, wondering if going there to investigate was perhaps a mistake. I have my suspicions as to who summoned the demon and the dates line up to when some pretty dark things were happening in our lives and some stuff like you would see in the movies. If only I kept a diary back then. One night I woke up with my eyes still closed and felt a presence and fought to keep my eyes closed and it finally left, but my BPM was probably 200. We were also involved in a project that made me rethink whether sh the Scottish play was an isolated incident. My best idea was to get the channeler in denial to do a cord cutting ceremony to sever ties with the person who I believed responsible. It seemed to work psychologically, but some creepy stuff still occurred now and then. We moved 2,500 miles away to a new place, and after a warning dream, I very assertively told the demon that the person who had channeled it was an inexperienced twit who didn't respect his power and to go right back to her and make her pay for wasting his time. Then the last dream I had was one where I was told to never again snoop this suspect and saw a sigil 
and was told that it was the sigil of the demon and that it was proof that the warning was real and to leave well enough alone. Stop for a second. Okay. Okay, there's a lot going on here. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, okay. First thing I'm going to say is I don't believe the person that they're claiming is a channel. I don't believe this person is a channel for a number of reasons. Primarily, you don't just accidentally become a channel. Like, you, you de have, that's an ability that you have to develop. Um, and so I think that there's some other s something going on here. I don't know if this could be an incident of lucid dreaming, if this is somebody maybe who just, maybe they talk in their sleep. You know, there are people out there who are yeah, perfectly capable of maintaining or, or, or having an entire conversation while in a sleep state, mm -hmm. right? Because of how their personal brain chemistry works. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't believe that this is, a, is a, an incident of channeling. I think there's something else maybe going on here. Um, one entirely, I'm not sure. Uh, we would need a lot more information to really be able to make a clear determination on that. Um, the second piece is they've mentioned this demon and the likelihood that this spirit that you feel is is hovering around or is close to you as a demon, not very good. I'm going to tell you right now. Um, for a demon to be representing showing up in this way and to be persistently dogging you from the sound of it in the way that just this just does not sound like demon. And as someone who, who is knowledgeable in these things, I'm going to say this is not demonic behavior. Um, so again, something else going on. Um, these are these are my my instincts and my opinions, mm -hmm. but they are based off of a lot of occult knowledge and experience. Mm -hmm. um, there's 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 either something that they have not shared with us in this story. There are details missing, like their own personal involvement in the occult. Mm -hmm. Uh, because they seem to be very on top of these things for somebody who, from what they've said, has no direct experience with these things. Mm -hmm. Right? And maybe they do and they just haven't shared that. Um, there's there's something missing. And there's a part of me as you're reading this, it's kind of like, uh, is this somebody just, just like having us on? Like, is this somebody who is, like, are they working on the manuscript for a story they're writing? And they just need some free feedback. Like, I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to be a dick. Mm -hmm. um, but there's just something about this to me. I'm like, this isn't legitimate paranormal experience. This is a combination of serious mental illness, some issue with somebody's sleep, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe too much science fiction. I don't know. I don't know. That's that's kind of where I'm at. And I'm sure if this person is listening to this response on the, our next episode, they're probably going to be really mad at me for that. But um, but that's kind of my take. Okay. Um, but no, I don't believe that this is a legitimate incident of channeling. Um, yeah, th there are just way too many holes in this for me. Anyway, please go on. Okay. <clears throat> I have never looked this person up online since. I did look up an old recording I had made when this person was talking in their sleep and seemed to be channeled in the past. It made my blood run a bit cold when I noticed that the calendar day and time were the same in 2014. Uh, as it was in 2017. The difference was in 2014, the channeler was held hostage in a dream by a spirit that was asking to be released from it. It also doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. In 2019, the channeler spoke once more, briefly, in a very different voice and claimed to be the subconscious of the channeler and had and that led nowhere. This person has since not channeled, but is pretty bloody apprehensive and doesn't like to talk about being the speaker's corner to whatever spirit, good, bad, or neutral, feels like talking uh, that night. The whole thing makes me feel, on one hand, blessed because I have proof that there's the afterlife I thought there was, concerned that it appears to have a component similar to that of an escape room slash Final Fantasy X style challenge, and also very alone in the knowledge because not many people would believe me and concerned to me, uh, concerned because I'm pretty sure this wasn't a trickster spirit because gut feeling, but I seem to have failed at finding all the answers I was supposed to before the connection was lost. I'm sorry this was such a long email, and I would like to talk with you sometime about the information I was given might mean, but I fear that if if the details such as the demon's name, the date of the summoning, or other details might make their way back to the person who sent it, and then they'll know that it worked and try more. I'm also not sure if the other details are supposed to be public knowledge, or if those codes only apply to me, and I'm worried that if it goes 
uh, goes live, the wrong person might know which is the right key, if that makes any sense. Anyway, if you just even believe me and don't think I've made this up, I'll be very grateful. Peace out, yours. You asked for a cool nickname. My usual nickname is too well known. Zoe's not my real name. It's the name of the plushie I bought in Laval. Um, the pocket watch fox. Very, very odd. Um, I'm going to agree with Mike on this. What it sounds like to me is there's probably some serious mental illness going on as well as some other sort of weird thing. I would really need to, we really need to know more detail. One, about your own personal, like, what are you doing in the occult? Because I'm going to tell you right now. Yeah. Well, and where did you learn the information that you're that you're basing a lot of this on? Because yeah, it sounds almost like is, new age light like, Yeah, like this is this is not how a lot of these things work. No, this is like people who are who have been so traumatized to a point that they have almost like well, some sort of weird DID. Going it's on. interesting that you mentioned trauma too, because with the the sleeper in this situation, I can't really call them a channel. Because I, I don't believe that's what's actually happening here, but the sleeper, they mentioned in that last bit that you were reading that this person has, um, there's something specific about a, a calendar date, that like mm-hmm. this is something that they do each time for like a particular date comes up. And again, to me, that, that kind of screamed, like, this is really, really repressed trauma coming yeah. up in some way, you mm-hmm. know, um, and not something that maybe is really based off of legitimate supernatural kind of experience mm-hmm. or phenomena. Um, you know, and so I think there's a lot going on here, and I think that um, before this listener looks for anything else to corroborate or to try to validate any of this as a supernatural kind of an experience, I, I think that some, I'm, I'm going to say, and this is going to make me sound like a dick, but I think some psychological evaluation probably needs to be done. It's always good to have those, to, to check off those boxes first. And the, the reality of a situation like this is, is there could be some sort of paranormal, supernatural thing going on, but stuff like this is so fucking rare to be that intense that when we, as individuals who have been involved in the occult, in witchcraft, in these practices for so long, hear it, we're like, uh-huh, okay. Well, and it, it's... I think when you it's hard to take at, a case value. when you look at a story like this, okay, and when I when, and when I say story, I, I'm not in any way trying to say like this is is fictitious because whether or not it's something made up, whether or not it's an issue of some serious mental illness or delusion, it really, it's yeah, the, the person believes this is happening, mm-hmm. right? Um, so really, you know, it, it's not about that. I think it's a matter of this is a good example of how people dive into or cultivate belief around particular types of supernatural phenomena and the way that they they think that things work and they haven't like they they haven't done the work to really build up to that knowledge yeah it's like when i talk in classes about how like everybody wants to jump to, to step eight you know which is fun because then you know i'm here and i'm doing the thing and things are happening but if you don't learn steps one through seven around like how things really work Mm -hmm. Like, anything could be happening to you at step eight, yeah. and you're going to think it's a supernatural kind of a thing. Exactly. When, when really, maybe maybe not so much. Yeah. Right? Well, we see this all the time with people who come into the shop. They want to start practicing witchcraft and magic, and the first thing they go for is the Judica Isles and Psychopedia It's, it's spell. the spell books. They, they and learn, yeah. they've not learned any form of mindfulness practice, grounding, energy. They have any of their shadow work. They don't know their any. correspondences or their alignments. Exactly. They, they have know. no idea about any of that. And so when they come in and they get that book... I am faced with a moral quandary because that is an expensive book. So I'm like, "Mm, I should just let them buy that. But then I'm like, "Mm." no, we don't want to send someone off to get into trouble. Exactly. Um, And so then I open up the conversation like, well, there's a spell in here about turning yourself into a werewolf. And that's not really what happened. So I have to open the line of communication for them. And then I usually turn them on to like another really good book for beginners or suggest some classes or something like that. And whether or not they take my advice is completely up to them. Because most of the time, these people come back with, well, how long have you been doing this? To which I'm like, longer than you've been out of the church. Okay, well, this isn't about you. So, um, so I very much agree with you, Mike, where it's like people want to jump from step one, not even step one, like step zero 
all the way to step eight and just really go for it. And I can admire the ambition there, but that's where a is lot of ambition people... though? Is it ambition? I think it's ambition, excitement, and the, the, the only reason I bring that up is because again, that that's what I'm basing my response on. Yeah. Okay. I'm not in responding the way that I did, you know, because I, I've said it repeatedly now. Like I, I, my response to that was, I'm sure definitely not what this person would have wanted to hear. Okay. I was in no way validating. And if anything, I punched a whole bunch of holes into this experience. Okay. Uh, but the reason I'm going that direction with this is learning and understanding how, first of all, how working with demonic spirits is, is effectively done, particularly over periods of time. Mm -hmm. um, Legitimate demonic spirits. Yeah. Um, you know, beyond that, you know, looking at, at other knowledge of other phenomena, things like astral work, lucid dreaming kinds of phenomena, the way that um, mental illness, because this is one thing that is worth mentioning here, that the fact that we... Uh, ascribe something to something or to a situation like this to something that could be more in line with a mental illness mm -hmm. does not preclude supernatural activity. No, it doesn't. We, we know for like more often than not that if you're dealing with a situation where there is some sort of mental instability and, and that person is also claiming to be having some sort of supernatural kind of an experience, mm -hmm. those things are very much go hand in hand. Yes. Because certain spirits, particularly trickster spirits and discarnates, they love the energy of people yes, who are they mentally do. ill. Yes, they do. Um, you are yummy, yummy snacks for those kinds of spirits when you are not taking care of your mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so, an easy end. So I'm not trying to say that there isn't there's nothing supernatural happening here, but with the knowledge that we've cultivated of how these things work, the systems of magic, the systems of practice, the way that spirits can work, just there, there's just something here. I'm just like, this is not right. The way that this person has strung this sequence of things together to make the story, there is there are huge plot holes here. Yes, there is something missing. Yes, um, and so I beyond that don't really have an answer for this. I, I, can't, I don't feel like I can answer this effectively. This exactly. Is, this is an incomplete question or it, an incomplete situation. Exactly. So there's your... So, so Zoe, if you would like to follow up with us, if there are any additional questions uh, or, or things that you want to provide or clarify, uh, we, we would ha be happy for that information. Yes. Uh, you know, and then we could maybe get back to you with, with something that would really maybe be validating or helpful. Um, but... Yeah, there's there's just yeah, there's a lot going on. Um, so I will I'll respond to you as well um, via email. Let you know that we have talked about this on the podcast. And then once you view this episode, if you still would like to work with us and have our opinions, great. If not, great. You live your best life. Okay, you have listener questions. I've got a couple of this uh, of listener questions this week. Um, so one of the first ones I want to talk about is actually a follow up on our episode last week where we talked about cleansing, clearing, and wording. Okay. Um, question from listener. Uh, say thank you so much for another great episode. Uh, they remembered that you once mentioned re-upping your wards. Uh -huh. How often do you recommend doing so? And is it simply a matter of repeating the original process of creating the? As with everything in magic and witchcraft, that is subjective. <laughs> um, when you re-up your wards, you want to make sure that there's a reason for doing it. There are some witches who have a schedule, you know, every month, every full moon, they, they go through and they re-up their wards and they do their things and just check the stuff out. And for the witches who do that consistently and ritualistically, I admire you. I don't do that. Um, now, here's the thing. In my opinion, if you are working magic consistently and you're doing things consistently the excess energy that's left over is going to also most likely be fueling those wards um so i without revealing too much of my personal practice i i will listen to my spirits if my spirits tell me that i need to reward then i will reward them um and sometimes it does look like doing the same thing. I have some, you know, really good wards and protections that I've become really familiar with that I really am like, you know what, I like this. We all have our standards. Yeah, we all have our standards. Yeah. Um, but I will I will shake things up on occasion, you know. I, I will also set a new ward if, let's say, I'm reading a book and I'm like, oh, that sounds like a really interesting spell. I will take that spell and I'll work it to 
to my benefit. I'll work it to how I want it to be because you can take other people's spells and you can rework them if you want as long as you're following the same outline and you're making sure the correspondences match up. You know, if someone's doing a love spell and one of the ingredients in the love spell is aconite, aconite I'm probably going to remove said aconite and add something else. Um, personally, um, that's a poisonous deadly love. That would be a black widow. That's the only kind of love. But so so that's how often I do it. There are some who will do it every full moon. There are some who will do it every dark moon. I, I, I want to be that. I but I want to live my black widow badass life. Baby, I don't have or be money. or be a praying mantis. Like after we mate, I'll just eat your head. You were answering. Okay. Anyway, so I'm scared now. You don't have to worry because we can't really mate. It's true. It's true. We keep trying. We don't have any babies yet. That's okay. Anyway, so... <laughs> um, gross. Ew. Sorry. Inappropriate. We, so, we, we had someone bring a baby into the shop today. We oh, did. Oh, my God. I even so held a baby. Cute. I held the baby and baby. I sang to the baby. baby. Anyway, so... She, she looked delicious. She's lovely. I love her. So, anyway, so... Re-up your words when you feel that you need to. Make sure that it's not coming from a place of anxiety and fear. Because chances are, if you're rewarding consistently, you know, once a week, once a month, because you're just afraid something may have gotten through, then your words aren't that good to begin with. But two... Yeah, this is why you put power into them when you're creating Exactly. Them. Also, as you're creating them, you can set a timestamp. Yes, you can. On those things. Like, you're going to do this job for me for the next six months. Yep. Um... And that's one thing that I noticed that a lot of people like fail to do in their spell work is raise power. They take mm -hmm. the they take the things, the components, they put it together, they do the things, and then boom, that was a spell. And okay, cool. Sometimes you'll get lucky, sometimes you won't. But all these people who are online, who are constantly in witch wars, I'm just like like the TikTok witch wars. The, man. Witch wars just get exhausting. And all I can say is every time I see a social media witch because I've determined that social media witches and real witches are very different things. Totes agree. Um, but every time I see a social media witch out there who's all caught up in some drama of some sort, I immediately block that group or creator. Yep. I immediately block that witch. Even if there were someone I was following before, I will immediately block them because one, no one has time for that drama and nonsense. Two. Two, sooner or later, they're going to turn that grief on you. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and three, if they're really that easily caught up in crap like that online, that tells me that, that they wish. have their, the foundations of their witchcraft or spiritual practice are bullshit. Yep. Because if you're really doing your work, you don't allow yourself to get caught up in nonsense like that. Mm -hmm. If you're actually doing the work, you're too busy to get caught up in that kind of thing. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. But when you're, when, when you feel you need to reward is when you need to do it, you know, it's always good to do a divination, you know, pull some cards or something, get a reading, um, check in with your spirits, see what's going on. How do they re-up a ward? Um, to re-up a ward, so you can go through the same process you did prior to that. Um, you could go a little bit more of just raise some energy, you know, go through, raise some power in your, in your space or wherever you're keeping that ward and then just redirect that energy back into that ward. Um, and, that, you know, it's just kind of like recharging a battery, honestly. You just boom, charge that shit back up. Yeah. So there You are, can use other things to keep your words charged, too. Yeah. Like, um, like the sun is a really powerful mm -hmm. charge. I mean, we, I mean, solar energy, right? It's a, it's a legit thing. Mm -hmm. It works for your spells, mm -hmm. right? Um, <clears throat> who was the one we knew? Who was the person that actually had a sigil that they used, and they would put that sigil on a charging dock? For something, do you remember who was that? Oh, that's a really we knew a witch who did that. They built this. They they created the sigil, and the sigil was meant to, to to have something to do with. I don't even. That's okay. It doesn't matter anyway. But one of the things that they would do is they actually would place this sigil on like a charging, like an actual like for their phone or something. Mm -hmm. So basically, in their idea and in their practice, it was this phone was consistently coming into connection with a power source. Or, or uh, a sigil, excuse me, the sigil was insistent. That's his chaos, chaos magic. Right right? Yeah, that's yeah. A, very, a very chaos magic approach. Um, uh, people love to work with the full moon, and I'll be honest, I, I think the full moon does have some ability to, to work as a charging kind of an aid, but mm -hmm. within reason, yeah. I think it's much more limited. Like, people think that you can put anything out in the moon and it's going to be charged, and it's like, that's insane, you're ridiculous. Get the fuck off of Pinterest, right? Um, you know, but, but the moon can be good for that, mm -hmm. you know, and there are other things that are good. Mm -hmm. 
fire is always good. Fire is good. You can use incense, as a matter of fact, in traditional, in, in some, some traditional sects of Wicca, that's what the incense is for. It's not to cleanse the space. It's to mark and to charge the space for the working or the Sabbath or whatever you're doing. Word. So. All right. Okay. Um, I think you, you, you answered that question admirably. Oh, thank you. Please, please go on. What do you have? Um, no, I, that, I only have the, I only ah, have the novel. Okay, you made like it sound like things. you had a whole bunch of shit again this week. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so, question from a, another YouTube listener. Um, Utu. I think Utu? No, that's okay. It doesn't matter. All right. So, um, they, they related just some personal stuff. They really love the podcast, all this stuff. So, okay. Um, this person says, I seem to have a lot of very epic dreams and dream experiences. Lucid, non-lucid, reoccurring characters and places, um, spirit animals... Uh, glory. Um, warnings, obvious signs, yada, 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 yada. Okay. Um, and they say that they actually feel like they, they recently had what would seem to be like the entire plot line for a story downloaded into their brain during a dream. Or they got this kind of inspiration from a dream. Um, and so they're wondering if this is a thing. Like, is there such a thing as dream witchery in their words? Yes. Yeah. I'm going to say yes. I mean, yeah. not just witchery. I mean, if we think about it, a lot of the most creative um, and inspirational individuals in art or music, um, they would get inspiration through their dreams. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, some of them would get it through anthropological studies as well, but a lot of them would get, get the image and the music and the focus for their symphony or their their most popular piece of art through dreams or images or stories that are being told in their mind. And so I'm going to say, no, dream witchery is totally a thing. As a matter of fact, there's, um, there's an, there's a book coming out by a mutual of mine, Elohim, um, who's a Llewellyn, uh, a Llewellyn oh, such a name dropper. Um, well, like I'm having to say it so I can go back and like it's ca it's actually called Dream Witchery, um, that's coming out, and so it's all about. Who, this is someone who's called themselves Elohim. I actually think that's like their real name. I'm probably uh, pronouncing it wrong. I'd have God, to pull them up. Okay, I'm like that's a that's a that's a name. Okay. Anyway, but um, but yeah, Dream Witchery is totally a real thing. Um, I mean hell. Dream witchery and spirit flight, flight. What's the difference, really, other than intention, focus, and where you're going? I would agree. I did dream witchery last night. Yeah, well, I mean, you think about things that you, like you talk about, um, you know, and they mention here, you know, they talk about, you know, like lucid dreaming. Um, you know, the one thing they don't really uh, throw out here um, specifically is astral work. But we know that dream activity, dream dream work, and astral work are very closely connected. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of overlap there. Yeah. Um, you know, and in a lot of the traditional witchcraft practices, you'll find you're going to have these concepts of like your hedge walking, right? Which is again basically just you know a, an old school term for astral travel work. Mm -hmm. um, but there are many traditions, including our own, that are actually rooted in astral travel work, lucid dreaming, Spirit and, and dream witchery. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, so yeah, so this is very much a thing. The way that you've tapped into this um, is a little bit different in the sense that you're actually uh, writing a story around this. Um, I, I would think that that would probably flow more within the realm of, of maybe just to get just kind of just inspiration, yeah. creative inspiration. But Sounds like that, you're in a connection with a muse. That was, I was going to say, yeah. a muse or a genius. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Not, not, have, not being a genius, but having a genius. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, those are, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So um, so this is a very cool thing, but yeah, to, get to answer your question, yeah, dream witchery is, yeah. Uh, is legit. I mean, I've gotten full-blown, like, movies of particular rituals that I've wanted to craft and create, and workings in dreams, and then I wake up and I forget them. So I started writing them down. Well done. Yeah, yeah, wow. Yes. Okay, Um. that was it, that was all I had. Oh, for questions, I only had a couple. I thought you you made it sound like again like you had a whole bunch this week. I I, I think this I did. The second week in a row that you've done this to me. Um, okay. I mean, it was a really long listener thing. There was a lot. There was a lot to that. This was a lot, and, and I, I feel a degree of concern for this listener's well being. I too um, also. So take care of yourself. Um. All right. So we've done listener questions. What did we? What do we want to talk about today? Well. Um, I would like to talk about uh, the up 
upcoming shift in the year moving into the darker times okay so um as as we know not all witches and we are witches i don't consider myself a pagan um a pagan the witches are different things pagans are witches are different things and so when we're looking at the will of the year as it was put forth by you know creepy old white men um what we have coming up is on september 21st which is the autumnal equinox which is mabon Okay. If you're Wiccan. If you're Wiccan. Wait, no, 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 because before it was acknowledged by Wiccans, it was it, it was a le- legitimate like Gaelic, Celtic practice, no, was it not? Mabon was actually just the name of, uh, I think, a Celtic god. Okay, well, I guess, I guess that's what I'm saying is, like, because I, I remember a couple years back, the, uh, like, the Welsh, the Gaelic, the Celtic witch community... Uh, online in particular was like all up in arms around like you people need to quit stealing our holy days like you took Samhain you took Beltane like would you just stop with this shit you know and this isn't even what Mabon is what are you doing this is all wrong just stop just stop you know um, and I remember that I was thinking like yeah those are angry white people we should listen to them I guess I don't know I don't know what I was thinking anyway uh, as we move um, into the darker time of the year with the autumnal equinox coming up and then we have like seven planets in fucking retrograde right now uh yes I think everything but Mars yeah it's just it's it's a little insane so, well some of those planets will be out of retrograde I think in the next yeah I think Mercury will be out of retrograde pretty, yeah. pretty sure some of them some so. of them move in and out of Mercury out of retrograde pretty quickly yeah so yeah. so what I want to talk about Uranus is in there until like I did say anus. Sorry, Uranus. 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 Um, Uranus is in retrograde until next year, Austin. (laughs) Anyway, I'm trying to make a point here. Oh, Um, yeah, look at that retrograde. Damn. How am I, the one who is on the medical Mary Jane, more focused right now? I think I had a day, and I came into this episode with a lot of fire and sass, and I was really mean. And now I'm kind of like, okay, I need to like put that away and try to have some fun. Okay, so as we're moving into the darker time of the year, um, there are some things that I want to bring up to people. Um, first and foremost, try and respect the the practices of other people. I, I can't tell you how many times I've had older pagans come into the shop, and no, no hate, no shade, but they're talking to, like, little, you know, newer witches or newer pagans are like, oh, well, you have to celebrate the full will of the year and make sure that you celebrate Mabon and Samhain, except for they usually say Samhain, and Yule. And we're sitting here, and and I just sit here and I have to look at this, and I'm like, wow, this is an entire generation trying to now teach and provide information to a newer generation. And there are people who are practicing or celebrating these rites who have one, no legitimate initiation to do that, and two, no idea what they're fucking doing. That's true. That's I, a good reminder to our younger listeners that just because someone has been involved in this situation a lot longer than you doesn't mean that they necessarily know more than you do. Exactly. I mean, I'm sitting here, and I, I there, there's, I, I watched someone in at the beginning of August who is not Celtic in any way, shape, or form perform a Lunasa ritual, and I'm like, Oh, people do that all the time. We have that group here in town that does the Lou thing each year, and it's basically just an excuse for them to get drunk and go and fuck each other's lives in the middle of the wilds here in, in Utah. And I just don't get it. And so I'm going to talk about some ways... Super traditional Lunasa. I'm going to talk about some ways, um, and I'd love your input, on how really? without specifying Mabon what you can do to prepare for the upcoming autumnal equinox. Um, it is a few weeks away, obviously, but forewarned is prepared, right? When is it? It is September 21st. Um, sometimes you'll see with equinoxes how it kind of moves to like the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. That's a um, Thursday. It is a Thursday. And as a matter of fact, we're doing... It's a, a work night. Well, here at Captain Cauldron, we're doing a free Mabon ritual. Um, all you have to do is bring offerings of fresh fall fruit. Okay, um, and the only reason I'm calling it Mabon is because that's what everyone knows it as. When you're a Wiccan, I was a Wiccan for quite some time, and so I'm going to get back to my old Wiccan roots for a second for the community. Well, and you have ancestry from that area of the world, so you can actually claim some of that, like old English, true, like UK ancestry. True. Like this is this is like your your ancestors, your people. Kind of, sort of. It's you know my dad's side. Anyway, so some things you can do. Um, one, 
go to local farmers markets when you get a chance if you haven't been able to um, harvest or grow your own things and support the local farmers because the autumnal equinox is the last harvest of the year it's the last harvest before we actually move into the um, the dark time where harvest is probably going to be very very sparse and so if you are a younger witch, someone who's newer, or someone who is a younger pagan, and you're trying to figure out how to do this and not break the bank, local local markets are going to be a little bit more pricey, but you're supporting local, and that's really good, because you're going to be able to help provide for them, and you'll be able to get probably some really good apples for yourself, depending on where you're at. So do that. You want to make sure that it is fairly quiet. You want to make sure you're giving offerings to your land spirits. Okay, making sure that you are acknowledging them as the quote unquote spirits fall asleep and letting them know that you will welcome them back next year. You will tidy up things. You'll make sure things are taken care of. As a witch, we're wardens of the earth. And so this is actually an opportune time to sit and refocus on some of your environmental and ecosystem habits where you're either not recycling enough or you're recycling but you're not actually recycling the right things um you're you know you're all about like the sustainability but then you're also like not supporting local businesses who make their own stuff said so you're going like full-blown corporate so this is a time of year for you to kind of sit and go within yourself and see what you can do to better prepare so that way when the when nature starts to wake back up again you can actually you can actually provide some really good things this is also going to be a good time of year to figure out some of the pl like planting that you want to do so if you've been wanting to try and figure out what kind of herbs or plants or flowers to plant in your garden in the spring this is a great time to do that and also research their components um not their components their alignments and their virtues so that way guess what you can have your own little magical garden yes What? Do you want to add, add, oh, add oh. to this? Please. All I was going to say is um, I don't acknowledge Mabon. Uh, neither does the Coven, really. Hmm. At least not in that way. Um, for us, it's basically just the Equinox. Yeah. It's just another thing to, to kind of mark the passing of the year. Mm -hmm. I will say, though, it is in a lot of older traditions like ours. It, what it really is, in essence, is it's kind of like that last hurrah. Mm-hmm before we move into the dark half of the year mm -hmm. at Shadowfest, mm -hmm. which is Samhain for Gaelic practices and Halloween for muggles. Yes. Um, so yeah, but at Shadowfest, the dark half of the year starts. Yeah. And so so the autumnal equinox, or Mabon, is kind of seen as like, this is your last night to focus on life and the light and uh, and what you need as a mortal human being to survive, because once we hit Shadowfest and we move into the dark half, mm -hmm. the, that whole chunk of the year is all about the dead, yep. the ancestors, the the world. At least in the northern hemisphere, the world is in slumber, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. So, um, so yeah. So that's all I got. I don't know what you want me to add. What did you want me to add? It, anything really. Carve pumpkins. Carving pumpkins is actually a really good thing to do. Probably don't do that around autumnal equinox, though, because I don't know if pumpkins will be in season. Oh no, they're in season, but you'll you'll, you'll obviously those pumpkins won't keep through to, to Shadowfest sure. or Halloween, so sure. you'll need to carve more pumpkins at Halloween. True, sure. um, but I don't know. That's kind of a cool way when you think about. I guess I guess where I'm going with that is that one of the whole things in looking at the element of harvest. That is associated with most of those fertility kinds of festivals that mm -hmm. we see, like with like Mabon, right? You know, uh, particularly as you look at the way that those festivals were acknowledged by very like like Gaelic traditions, mm -hmm. Gaelic practitioners. Those all have some process or something to do with the like the cycle of fertility, yes, as it would relate. They're to fertility the year, cults, yeah. right? They're they're old fertility cults, those pagans, right? Um, which is you know which is fine, but that doesn't mean that they're witches. Um, so um, and I'm a witch, so I do these things differently, um, but. Um, but those that element of harvest, though, is really important when you think about it because it's not just about the harvest of the land. It's very much a macrocosm, microcosm kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at the significance of something like Mebon or other harvest types of festivals, um, it is just as much about what you are harvesting within yourself 
or how you are able to take a moment to kind of look within and kind of check in, like, where am I at in my life? Like, what have I done for myself this year? How have I challenged myself? How have I faced challenge? How have I grown? You know, how am I healing? How am I whatever, you know, whatever it is, right? Like, where, where, how did I do on my projects for yeah. this year, right? Well, are you physically, um, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually prepared for the dark times that are coming up that are going to force you even further to look at those things? Exactly. So, um, so that's, that's kind of an important thing that I think people need to bear in mind when we look at a, a holiday like Mebon. It's not just about the world and nature and the, the significance of the God cycle or the fertility, right? You know, it's not about that as much as it is. I think it's really... Again, just an opportunity for for people to do their their personal work. Yeah, um, you know, and personal work is always a component of an effective witchcraft practice. If you think I'm wrong, then you're wrong. Personal work is that's right. I said it. Well, I said it. Such a gatekeeper. No, personal work is very important, and I think that's something that we should talk about tonight uh, a little bit more um, before we really get too too far off track. But like the importance of personal work in in witchcraft and becoming a full-fledged, healthy, and balanced, magical practitioner. Because there's a lot of people out there who provide their services and and the work they do, but they're not actually doing any of their own personal work. You can usually tell. Well, you should like, be I, able to I, tell, I, I but find, there's plenty yeah. of people out there who are really good actors. Yeah. Like, if you're going and working with someone and they're asking you to do things or they're doing performing work in a particular way for you and this isn't just witchcraft this could be your psychic this mm-hmm. could be anybody else who's working for you in some sort of spiritual capacity somebody who's teaching you something um, you know but if through interaction with that person it kind of becomes clear like wow this is becoming very much a do as I say but not as I do kind of a situation mm-hmm. right like that's a problem you've got somebody telling you like you need to do your shadow work and you need to blah 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 you need to blah 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 whatever it may be right but then you look at their life and like and they're riddled by addiction they have a piss poor relationship that you know is never going to get better Mm-hmm. Um, you know, their life is just in general in shambles. Mm-hmm. And they are at the core of their being really kind of a, a shit person. Mm-hmm. Like, that's probably a clear sign right now that that person has really probably not done the work they should have done to be in a position to be teaching you 100%. anything or doing any kind of spiritual work for you. And I want to be really clear, okay, about that because people hear that and they're like, well, you know, what the fuck, right? You know, and in no way am I trying to say that we have to be perfect. No. None of us are, and none of us are perfect. And we all screw it up, mm-hmm. except me. And <sighs> we, we, we are, you know, and we, we have to acknowledge that piece. We're always constantly growing and evolving. Mm-hmm. And all of us are going to, again, we're going to have a bad day. We're going to, you know, we're going to have a moment where, you know, maybe we, we, we're, we're a bit of a hypocrite. We're going to have those things, right? Because we're human, mm-hmm. right? But those should ideally be rare kinds of moments or they should at least be moments that are are addressed in a very conscious kind of a way we're aware of them right and in the process of, of you know discovering like oh i did this today and this was really kind of a, a personal letdown like i did not show up and be my best self in this moment in mm-hmm. whatever capacity you know um in that moment we, we we need to to really look very carefully at that and if we're working with people who are obviously having those moments we need to be very mindful of what it is we're taking from those people in the realm of information mm-hmm. and service well right? I, I 100% agree and it's also up to you damn well better the, the practitioner themselves to one know their limits this is where the concept of like ego bad is completely wrong there were years um, when I first started my Reiki training certification and went through the training and everything like that, where I wouldn't work with anyone if they were coming to see me for like SA trauma, like help. Cause I haven't worked through my shit. Mm. I can't help you if I'm not helping myself. I, I wouldn't think who are these. I, I, okay. I'm sorry. I'm processing that. I'm like, uh, who are these people that would go to get Reiki for SA trauma? Body keeps the score. I understand that. Like, I understand the idea of, like, physical healing or how, how all aspects of our being overlap. But I hear shit like that, and I'm like, that just seems like one of the, some of the most self-destructive spiritual bypass. It is. To me. That's assuming that's the only thing they're doing. Exactly. Uh, that's fair. That's exactly. Fair. They, and, maybe they are also in therapy. Well, that's and that's the thing is most of the time these people did, and I'd have to tell them, like, I'm sorry, but I'm also going through the same level of therapy you are. Your trauma is not the same as my trauma, and I can't help you with this. If you want me to help you with your bad ankles, you want me to help 
you know, help clear your energy, help kind of get some of that funk out, I can help. But actually, like, helping alleviate that energetic weight of that, I can't touch that because I'm touching my stuff right now and I'm incapable of helping you. You are touching your stuff. We're recording a podcast. Would you please behave? <laughs> and at first, your anus is in retrograde. Now you're touching your stuff. For God's sake, Austin. <sighs> Mom watches these. Uh, well, then she's probably going to be just as disappointed in you as I am right now. <sighs> Sorry, Mom. God. <laughs> but that's the thing is, like, you as the practitioner need to be so aware of yourself and have a good enough window of perception that every person who's coming to you isn't basically reliving your trauma. And because you had that, everyone who's coming to you is that. Like, I mean, it, it, it's just so prevalent. It's so prevalent because these are also individuals who try and spiritually bypass their own healing and are the last people these practitioners are the last people who will actually go to a doctor and be like, hey, so I'm having, like, panic attacks on the daily. I need something to help with that. No, instead, their response is going to be, oh, I just need to ground more. Or I just can't handle this, so I'm going to disconnect. Or I'm just going to sit here and rock back and forth. Is having panic attacks on the daily a bad thing? Yes. Oh. Probably shouldn't be having panic attacks on the daily. But that's how I diet. You burn a lot of calories in that kind of a state. Except it, your cortisol levels are so high. Dying. Yeah, that's true. Well, afterwards, like you crash and then you just eat everything, right? Yeah. So, yeah, oh god, you're right. Maybe I'm really not doing that. Self-care. That's probably why it's one oh, not working. Oh god. <laughs> anyway, so but that's something that is very important for practitioners and anyone who's going to other practitioners for assistance or mentoring to understand is that personal work is one never ending, and if you are in contact with someone who's self-perception is large enough that they're actually like, oh yeah, no, I can't help you with that because I, I mm -mm. then that should be a sign that this is someone you should still keep around and you should still work with yeah. on some capacity. Because they can help you with something else. Because right? they can help you with something else, yeah. you know. Or um, as they grow, maybe they'll figure it out and then they can help you with that. Exactly. I mean, it happens all the time when people come in and ask me about more stuff. I'm like, I don't fucking know. Here's a book. I'm kidding. I'm going to say this and it's gonna not be a popular thing to say or to hear but you and I as not Norse pagans we know more about Norse paganism than most of the Norse pagans that we deal with I said it I said it all the truth is coming out tonight maybe y'all need to y'all need to, to to read your books and learn your stories and study the culture and the history and the archaeology and the anthropology and you know y'all need to study this stuff um because if you did that it would all give you a much better basis for your practice instead of just thumping your chest braiding your beard and getting a mule in your tattoo also the celts are not norse yes also that yes the celts yeah the celtic people yeah they were not norse yeah those cultures if i remember correctly they they fought quite a bit and then they they, they think at one point eventually did get to a point where they were actively trading um, yes, but very different people. Very different people. Very different practices. Yes, yes, the fact that you have English ancestry, yeah, that, that doesn't mean that you're by default a, a Norse person or, or that you should do the uh, the folkish, uh, I can only be a Norse pagan bullshit that a lot of people do because, oof, oh God. Sorry, I'm on the Norse thing this week because I was just reading an article on the AFA and phew, those people all need to die in a fire, let me tell you right now. Um, what happened? Is it the AFA? I think it is the AFA. Is it, is it the AFA? Oh, no, it's the American Family Association. The minister? Basically, it's one of the... the it's, it's the big Norse pagan group here in the U.S. that is, like... That was started by Stephen McNallan. And they're, like, super white supremacist awful. Oh. Anyway, that's okay. I will quit shit-talking the, shit the Norse now. Um, I don't think I have anything else. No, I need to know about the article you read. It was nothing new. It was just an article on the roots of the white supremacist component in the Norse pagan community. And there, there's a huge... We don't even need to talk about this. We've talked about this on the podcast before. Anybody at this point who is like, oh, the Norse pagan community doesn't have a problem with white supremacy. Yeah, those people are fucking idiots. And in denial. Ah! Anyway. Would you say that the personal work that you were referencing a moment ago 
I want to be really clear. I am not anti-Norse pagan. I am not. We are not anti-Norse. Lots of people who are Norse pagan, close friends who are Norse pagan. Yes. Right? Isn't that exactly what people say when they accuse you of being something like, I couldn't possibly be. I have black friends. Right? You, I could you possibly have Norse be. I have Norse pagan friends. Um, I we love are, that. We are not um, anti-Norse paganism. No, we're anti-Nazi. We're, we're anti we're anti 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 and anti-Nazi. And anti-Nazi. Um, and if you cannot differentiate those two, you're part of the problem. Yeah, you're a part of the problem. Um, Anyway, do you think that the personal work... I'm going to say this real quick and then we need to wrap up our episode. Do you think that the personal work that you were talking about a moment ago, um, would you agree that when people are pursuing witchcraft or really any kind of spiritual practice, any kind of legitimate spiritual practice, right? I'm not talking eclectic kinds of practices because you can't really grow in eclectic practices because you're basically just taking a piece here, a piece here, a piece here. And at the end of the day, you might have a complete puzzle, but every piece of that puzzle is from a different puzzle. You don't get any kind of consistency or a clear image with a that cohesion. Shape. Okay, yes, there's no cohesion. Okay, um, anyway, so but would you say that people who are pursuing a legitimate, like this is a good, effective, helping you do what you need to do kind of spiritual practice, that like 80% of that practice should be the personal work. Yes. The yes. other 20% is your rituals and your spells. And and yes, to be honest, the fun stuff. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of personal work as you're doing it is not fun. But as you get to a moment where you can kind of check in, you're like, oh, this used to scare me and it doesn't anymore. Or I used to not be able to do this mm -hmm. and now I can, right? Those are also really rewarding and fun moments. It is. Well, right? it, the goal is that they should weave together seamlessly. Well, exactly. Like you're doing them all at the same time. It's like, yeah, oh yeah, don't, you don't have to try to strive for perfection and then like only once I'm a perfect being can I do a spell. Yeah, it's Because we've seen that people take that approach and that doesn't make you a witch. That makes you an armchair occultist. And you're never going to achieve perfection and none of us will except me. None of us ever will except me. Um, anyway. So would you agree? Like the, the personal work is so important. It yes. really needs to be, you know, and there's no one way to do that, right? Because we're also different and every practice is different. And part of that personal work is going to involve a huge degree of education yes. and learning and, uh, and uh, healing. Mm -hmm. Because most of us who come to any kind of alternative or individual kind of a spirituality are going to have a good degree of a lot of shit to deprogram. I agree, 100%. And we need to heal. Yes. Okay. Okay. So as we wrap up the episode, there are two things that I'm going to drop. Okay. So on September 5th, we have the Witches Familiar class being taught by myself. The Witches Familiar class, you can register for. It is available online or in person. All you have to do is call the shop or stop into the shop, even better, to get registered for it. You do have to pre register. Please do not just show up because I need to have an idea of how many people are going to be there because we're actually doing a working. Anyway, um, I do believe it is $20 a person. All that information can be found on our Facebook as long as as well as our website. We also have on September 9th uh, Runes with Forest. Again, we are not anti Norse. We are anti white supremacists, anti bigotry, and anti Nazi. Discovering Runes with Forest. And it's going to be a really good class. Yes, it's going to be really class awesome. class is not just on runes, the, like the Futh arc, but it's on the history, the ethics of not only that alphabet, but about other magical alphabets mm -hmm. and how magical alphabets, ha uh, historically, how magical alpha alphabets, why is that word so hard for me, um, have been so closely connected to magical practice. Yes. Um, um, and that itself is also $20. Yes. And it's available online and, and in person. Available online. Yep. And in person. Yep. So it's online and in person. Again, stop into the shop or give us a call. We can get you registered for that. Forrest is a fantastic person who knows their stuff about this. So we are looking forward to that. I'm hopefully going to be maybe popping into that class after I close the shop. I don't know if I'll have the time. But other than that, we you have... We are very busy. We are very busy. I am, yes. But other than that... All the stuff that you want to find at Captain Cauldron by us, done by us, for the community, for you, can be found on our website, www.captaincauldron.com. Any of our social media pages, you can find that because we have an amazing marketing manager who takes care of that for us. And secondly, um, something else that is really awesome is that we are always open to listener questions. So like, share, subscribe, and we look forward to hearing from you, okay? Yes, and be prepared for like an honest answer to your question, as witnessed by the start of our episode tonight, we are not in the business to bullshit you. We are not just going to tell you what you want to hear. And if you send us something and we're like, yeah, probably not witchcraft, you're probably just nuts, that could very well be the answer you get. We are the salty witches. Um, you know, so so be prepared. 
We will, of course, try to do that in a very compassionate way. Or a wrathfully like, compassionate it's not way. witchcraft, baby. It's okay. You're just, you're just fucking insane. It's okay. It's okay. Thank you, everyone. Happy witching and stay salty. <laughs>